I said it once, and I'll say it again. There's a party in heaven right now. Amen. And if you don't believe me, that's, well, you need to open your Bible and open it up to the book of Luke. And Jesus says that when one soul comes to, to, to Christ, angels sing, and they, there's a party going on in heaven right now. So, this is the very first growth in growing together. And next week, we have two more. And we're going to have, I would love to be able to have, and I would love to be able to come to our cleaning lady and say, I have more work for you. In the work of cleaning the baptism once a month, and in order for us to be able to fill it, to have at least one baptism a month. Wouldn't that be something? Amen. So, but that requires, that requires we all come together. It requires that we all begin to work together. And why do I say that? Because growing is a biblical concept that Jesus clearly made very clear. If you abide in me, you will produce fruit, much fruit. If we are connected to Christ, we will produce much fruit. Fruit is a symbol of growth. When you have a fruit, when you take that nice juicy mango out, out of that tree and you eat the fruit and then you take the pit and you plant it, another mango tree is going to come up that will produce not one mango, but many, if not thousands of mango throughout its lifetime. That is Jesus' desire for you. And that is Jesus' desire for our church as we grow together. So I want to encourage you to, some of you have already texted, uh, thank you for doing that, um, to take this opportunity to um, scan the QR code and or text, and we look forward to uh, moving forward in that direction with you all. Uh, if you would like a copy of this book at the end of the service, uh, please come and see me. Uh, and uh, we will start getting you on your way to be a part of growing together. I would like to also take this time before we begin to invite you to pray with me because we are going to embark on a journey now for the next few weeks on a theme that is crucial to our understanding of who we are before God's eyes. So I'll get into that right after we pray. Let's pray together. Father God, what an awesome Sabbath it's been so far. What an awesome opportunity to see your kingdom growing as a result of the decision David has made. But Lord, I know that this is not the last of the fruits that you have in store for us to reap. And so as we dive into this sermon series, Father, let us help us understand what is so important that you would want to dwell with us. Help us to see you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The focus of God. If I were to ask you this question, what is the focus of God, what would you say? Saving? Okay. His people? How so? To be with us. Okay. His people? To be with us? Saving? Anybody else? Repentance. To focus his his focus is to admit, help us acknowledge that we need to change. Okay, very good. What if God appeared to you in a dream? I had a really weird dream last night. Really weird. I, I'm going to ask my wife to ask me about it, so I can one day I will share it because the dream is so weird. It's completely off topic, but. If God appeared in the dream to you today, 
and said, just like he did to Solomon, I'll grant you one, one wish. What would you say? What would you ask for? All right? Ironically, that wasn't Solomon's answer, which blows my mind, right? He asked for wisdom. But to go to heaven, that would be, I, I would hope that that would be all of our requests, right? I would hope that that would be the top of the list. You get one wish, what, what do you want to go? I want to go to heaven. Okay, Amen. done. But meanwhile, you still have to live here. But did you know that in order for us to make it to heaven, we need to desire heaven? Well, duh, come on, Pastor Art, that's obvious. No, no, seriously. If you want to make it to heaven, you have to yearn for heaven. We do that in a very micro uh, re reality when we say, oh, I want to be a doctor. What do you have to do? Then you start working to become that. You go to school, you go to med school. I want to be a professional athlete. You start investing time and money in your training. I want to be, and you fill in the dot, you start working towards that goal. So if our top priority is heaven, you catch where I'm going with this? We need to start thinking about heaven. We need to start preparing for heaven. We need to start working towards heaven. Well, Pastor Art, we can't earn salvation. Great point. Awesome. Which leads me straight into my sermon for this morning. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalm, chapter 27, verse 4. If you don't have your Bibles and you have your phones, I'm going to help you. It's on the screen. Okay, It's in the New King James Version. I like the New King James Version because it, it's nuanced. To It doesn't have all the these, thous, and thou shalt nots. And it's, just, it's a, it's a slim, simp, simp, excuse me, simpler English. But it also holds a little bit truer. So here it is. This is David. One thing I have desired of the Lord. One thing. Who was David? He was the king. Wouldn't you say he had it all? Wouldn't you say he had every comfort of life available to him? He had everything a man could want, or a woman, hopefully, but one thing he desired of the Lord, I will seek. Remember, we talked about yearning and desiring, right? We talked about if you want to make it, you got to work for it. If you want to uh, be an officer, you have to go through officer training school. If you want to be a dentist, you got to go to dentist, dentistry school. If you want to be a musician, you got to start playing something and learning music theory and and. You fill in the blank, whatever it is. And those of you that are professionals and are working, you have had to work to get to where you are. And so David is saying here, I desire one thing of the Lord, and I am going to seek this, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Steve, can you do me a favor? Or actually, no, Tyler. Tyler. There's a ring chime right here in the wall. Could you just unplug it for me, please? It's on the wall. Just go up. On, you'll see it. It's on the ADHD. Sorry. Just yeah, I, I, it, I'm, I'm trying. To, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Where were we? So here's David. Wanting to be in the presence of God, okay? I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his holy temple. 
You know, there's something, I read this, and we tend to focus on the very first part here. It's so wonderful that he's seeking to be uh, in the presence of God, but here's the question that begs to be asked. What temple? There was no temple back then. So much so that he wanted to build a temple, and God said, no. You're not doing this, but your son will be. So how do we know where do we go to find out what temple is he talking about? Before we do that, let's review. In the Bible, we have the story of Adam and Eve. God created man and woman in his image. He created us, both male and female. And he said, be fruitful and multiply on this earth. But something happened along the way that they got disconnected from God. And the Bible says that in the very early part of the morning, they were walking in the garden. And they heard God walking in the, in the garden. And they hid and God asked them, Adam, Eve, where are you? And they said, we heard you, so we hid. What comes through your mind when all you know is the God who has created you, a God who has provided for you, and now you're afraid because he's calling you? So that happened. Then we have the next major story in the Bible is Noah. The Bible says that God repented for having created mankind because all of man's hearts were evil. Well, if a God is a loving God, why would he destroy the earth? Well, just follow along with me. God desired to save human race and he endeavored by trying to re pushing a reset button and so he created this idea and gave Noah the blueprint and said here gonna go and build this ark and you take all these animals in there with you and we're gonna reset humanity he did we know that didn't work and then God next calls Abraham. He says, listen, I want you to leave your household. Go to a place that I will show you, and I'm going to bless you. If you follow me, if you, if, if you heed to my covenant, I will bless you. I will make your name great. I will make your family as, your, as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand in the sea. And he did. It took him a little while. He was a hundred and plus years old when he had his first child. No thank you. I'm 47. I got two. I don't want more. At a hundred, all the work that goes into that, I love kids. Please don't get me wrong. I love my kids. But at 100, the fact is that he had to wait 20 years since the promise. Talk about a test of faith. Noah had to, he waited 120 before the inception of the, uh, of the blueprints of the, of, of the ark until the actual fulfillment. But nevertheless, then we have the story of Jacob and Esau. That leads to Jacob and Joseph. And Joseph here is a type of savior where he goes into a far land to save his family. And so now the years go by and the people in his family has grown into this multitude 
that it becomes so overbearing and so large in numbers that the actual king of the land, the Pharaoh, said, this group of people are going to become a threat to us unless we enslave them. And so he did. And then we have Moses. You know, that picture doesn't, doesn't do Moses justice, I don't think. The Bible says that he was the meekest man that has ever lived. Does that look like a meek man to you? I mean, think about it. To deal with now a nation, God tells him, go. Talk, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Go tell them that I want my people to come and worship me. Moses reluctantly goes. Then we have the story of the ten plagues in the book of Exodus. And then after the ten plagues, there's the firstborn. And then they are granted to leave, but, but Pharaoh decides to, what did I just do? I just threw away my cheap labor. Let's go after them. And then we have the story of the opening of the Red Sea. They march across on dry land, they get across, and then Pharaoh's army is swallowed up by the water. And then they're in the wilderness, right? They have been enslaved for 490 years, and, and now as they're in, in the wilderness, they've just been saved and freed, and they walked across a miracle. They saw the walls of the, of the sea open up, and, the, and, the, and the, the, the road that they walked across used to be water and, and, and wet sand. You, we know what happens when you walk on wet sand. You sink. But the Bible says it was dry land. They walked across it, and they got across, and then a couple of days later, they're, you brought us here to die. And God says, I got you. And provides the manna. And that wasn't enough. Because a couple days later, they're like, you brought us here to die. Oh, you want water? Here, so Moses goes and actually hits the rock. And from the rock comes water. All of these stories are sermons in of themselves. Right? But here, we come to a point in time that when we look at the text that David has says one thing I have desired of the Lord here's a completely contrasting difference between what David was yearning and asking for from the general population of the Israelite nation while they were focused on themselves and getting what they wanted in order for, so they could be comfortable, he's asking to be in the presence of God all the days of his life. There is a contrasting difference between what the people want and what one person wants. I mean, it's, we can look at our government and we can, I'm not going there. But David decided to be in the presence of God, to be and to inquire in his holy temple. But God, what he's done, he summons Moses up back to the mountain and gives him a set of instructions. The first, the Ten Commandments, we have that in, in Exodus chapter 20. But then, in chapter 25, he says something he had never said before. You know what that is? And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Let that sink in for a minute. God wanted to be with his people. 
God wanted to be in the same presence, in the same area, in the same zip code, in the same street address, in the same everything that his people were in. Would you be able to handle God living next door to you right now? Because this is exactly what he did. He said, hey, Moses, I'm coming. I want to live with you. And here's how you're going to know that I'm with you. I'm going to give you a set of instructions based off a pattern. And I want you to build this. And I'm going to endow gifts for people to be able to do this. It's fascinating. If you have not read the book of Exodus and Leviticus for the time that they built, they came together to put the sanctuary together, it says that God gave gifts of art, artisans, of art to artisans so they could do the engravings. He gave gifts of music to those to sing so those that probably didn't sing before could sing now. He gave gifts for those who could build that couldn't build before, now can build this. It's fascinating because God wanted to be with his people that I may dwell among them. So this next few weeks, we're going to spend a few moments, or I should say, talking about the sanctuary. Why? Why? Eighteen forty four happened. If you're not familiar with the date, eighteen forty four was a day that the Millerites they projected Jesus to come back. Well, Pastor Art, didn't they read their Bible that no man knows the hour and coming? Well, yeah, you have a point. However, nothing forbids us from studying prophecy to understand God's will. And so by them studying the prophecy, William Miller, more specifically, he came to the conclusion that in October 23rd, excuse me, 21st, 1843, was the first date. That came and went, never happened. Then then he went back and he figured out his calculation was wrong because he didn't factor in for year zero, before and after death. A Christ, excuse me. He went back and then he came up with October 22nd, 1844. And it's known, you can Google it, it's known as the Great Disappointment, where these people, they came together and they understood that Jesus was coming back on that day. And what did they do? Farmers never plowed their and harvested their crops. People quit their jobs. Because this is the day that Jesus is coming back. And they became a laughingstock. But God provided for them. Those that left their crops in the field went back and found that their crops had not rotted. They have found that whatever it was that they had going, that they gave up, God provided for them and then some. And so based on that, years later, a woman by the name of Ellen White wrote this. The subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it as brought to light the position and the work of his people. They had it right to a degree, but not all of it. See, when we understand, when we begin to see the sanctuary and the way that it was built, and we begin to look at the earthly sanctuary because that's what we have access to based on the Bible, but we know that that is a pattern, we begin to understand clearly God's desire for mankind. 
we begin to see why he wanted to dwell with his people. You know he still wants to dwell with his people today? And you're saying, wait a minute, Pastor Art, but didn't Jesus happen? Yes, Jesus came and he died on the cross. But be, all of that was typified in the sanctuary thousands of years before he came, he showed up. Ahead of time. Which leads you to think that Jesus knew he was coming to die. Do you know what it's like to go somewhere knowing that that might be your last place you will ever see alive? Some of you do not. Most of you. But some of you do. Those who have served in the military. And I deal with people who have gone, and when they go and they get deployed... They don't know if they're coming back. Jesus knew he was coming to die. And to best illustrate what he did for us, he gave us the sanctuary message. So when we looked upon it, we could see his purpose, his focus, his desire. You see, the courtyard was established when he gave, they gave the pattern. The courtyard has two primary functions. Rick, you can't answer. What do you see out here? Let me just, for those of you that have never seen this image, this is a, a replica of the sanctuary. Okay? So you have the tabernacle here which inside there holds the most holy places divided into two compartments. The, ta the, the, the sanctuary or the tabernacle was, was set up in a big rectangular, all proportioned. The most holy place was a square, while the, other, while the holy place was the, the size of that square and another. So it was equally proportioned. Inside the most holy place had the Ark of the Covenant. We will talk about all of these. I'm going backwards intentionally. Then inside the holy place, you had the table of showbread. You had the um, altar of incense. And you had the golden lampstand. All of these typified some kind of ministry. And then outside of the tabernacle, you have the laven. Uh, the bronze laven where, where the priests would wash themselves. And then you had the altar of sacrifice. And to delineate the boundaries, you had this done in pure white. Think about this. They were in the desert. Okay. It was proportioned, roughly 150 feet long by 75 feet wide. Proportionate to this, just bigger. There's about 22 and a half feet here and 30 feet here and 22 and a half feet there. The entrance was about seven and a half feet tall, seven foot six inches, about here. All of this was done intentionally. If you have studied this, there's only two elements that were done outside the temple. The sacrifice and the washing. I'm going to get into those next week. But I do want to say this and leave you with this. Everything that happened in, inside the sanctuary was for a specific time frame. And everything that happened outside of the sanctuary was designed to take place to illustrate Jesus' ministry on earth, here on this earth. And everything that happened in the sanctuary pointed us to Jesus. Everything. Because the sanctuary became central to, the, to, to life. Every week, the, the priests would blow their trumpets to announce the coming Sabbath. 
Every month, the priests would blow their trumpets to announce the feasts and that would take place, the holy days for that month, and what type of, month, what type of feast it was. Every quarter, there was another event happening, the harvest time, the sowing time. And every year, and every 50 years, there was something. It's all there outlined. If you take, if you go back and you read it, you will, you will see it. But the courtyard resembled Jesus' work on this earth. That's why it's important for us to understand this. So we can understand why Jesus would say, abide in me. He wants us to abide in him. Why? Again, in Exodus 25, it says, I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them up out of the land of Egypt, that I may dwell among them, and I am the Lord their God. Unfortunately, there's only three, two occasions that the, you find this. is not Exodus 25, 8. That's actually Exodus 29, 42 and 43, that particular verse. There's copying error on my part. But there are only two times in the Bible that God said, I want to dwell with man. It's right here. It's him announcing what he's about to do for us. I want to dwell with you because I'm getting ready to show you what I'm about to do for you. I want to dwell with you because you matter. I want to dwell with you because I created you. I want to dwell with you because I'm going to die for you and resurrect so that you can be with me one day. What is it that you are yearning for today? What is it that you are preparing for? Is it heaven? Are you desiring to, to be like David? Could you, uh, Andrew, go back to the slide that very beginning it talks about the it's Psalm 27, verse 4. Is this your one desire? Is this what you want for all the days of your life? If it's not or has not been, there's, I have good news for you. It's not too late. Amen. It's not too late. Jesus said, anybody who comes to me, I will not turn away. Amen. Anybody who wants to come and see, let them come. You know, I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you find your spiritual walk with God. But this, this is the one thing that I, my, my desire for you is this, that you come. Come to Jesus, but you come. Come with the desire to be in his presence. Because that's what the sanctuary is all about. Is you living in God's presence without fear. Knowing that he wants to dwell in your life. In your house. In your street. In your neighborhood. He's coming to live with you. May God bless you.